words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart find favor with you, my rock and my redeemer. I want to start out with gratitude to Rabbi Mark. This is my fourth High Holiday Sermon, and they've been powerful experiences for me. And I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to do this every year. I love you, and thank you. I want to give gratitude to my family who comes and supports every year, and it makes it extra special when you have your parents and grandparents and sisters and aunts and kids and your wife and nieces come and uh, support you. I want to thank Harriet for uh, giving me a moment of honesty this morning. I always, uh, most of the time I like honesty. And two people I want to thank in particular. I said when I spoke a couple of nights ago on Arab Rosh Hashanah that I would love to live in a world where everybody was always crying with tears of joy. And today, as Rabbi's mother was talking to me, about the pleasure it is for her to be here and to see her son and to see the community and to see the camaraderie and to see the caring for her first time at the high holidays. You had tears in your eyes. So thank you. I had somebody else come up to me and make an amends an hour ago and he was uh, tearing up and he was starting to cry in the midst of the amends. He's been touched by the high holidays. He's been touched by Rosh Hashanah and the tears were tears of joy. And I've had them a few times as well, so I, I won't always want to start with gratitude to ground myself. I began writing my first attempt at a sermon, and the best part of it was hitting delete. <laughs> the theme this year is moral engagement, the struggle to be aware that we are all part of a larger whole. In truth, awareness is only the prerequisite. Action or engagement is the goal. Engaging with your fellow, striving to be aware and to care in thought and deed about others and also about yourself, and about your relationships, and about community, moral engagement. I was writing about moral engagement and I found myself waxing philosophical, a tendency that I have. When the truth is, at the time that I was writing this, I was having a difficult time staying morally engaged. I was having struggles with individuals. I was having struggles with the community which I belong to and help lead. It's nobody's fault. It's the way of life. Don't you know life is a drama? Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say, Heschel was a descendant of the prophets, one of the great rabbis of the last century, in case you never heard of him. Heschel also was in many ways alone in the world. He was morally engaged with the world, but in some ways he was disengaged as well. For much of his life, he hid in books, books that he read and books that he wrote. He never found a way to be engaged with his colleagues or even his students at seminary. And in fact, he was an outcast at JTS, where he was a professor. <laughs> Having lost his whole family in the war, in the Holocaust, he, well, he was a Hasid in the United States with no tzaddik, no leader to guide him, and no family to speak of. Heschel had a hard life, and only now, after he's passed, is he greatly revered. I talk about Heschel because knowing that he struggled with moral engagement, such a great and wise man, it gives me hope through my struggle, and I hope gives you hope through yours. I talk about Heschel because when I'm lost, as I was prior to writing this sermon, I pick up one of his books, and I find comfort in his words of truth and love. I have a confession to make. I struggle big time just living life. I struggle being human. I want to live on a higher plane. But sometimes this is just because I want to escape this place. Nothing wrong with that. It is our way as humans to fantasize about peace and freedom. These types of fantasies have sustained the Jewish people through much war and much enslavement. 
The hard facts are, you have to live in this world to attain the next. We have to transform this world into the world of our dreams. And this world is hard, boy. It's made of dirt and rocks and roots and blood and pain and confusion. It is not easily transformed or molded. It's so hard to even care and even harder to keep caring, as Paul spoke about. The deeper you see into reality, the truer this is. Moral engagement. How can I even speak of moral engagement when I am in moral outrage at the state of affairs I see every day? How can I engage in a world that seems, as my friend Adam Mandel would say, toxic? How can I even engage with myself when my own thoughts have been corrupted, no different than the news and commercials on television. I look to religion for guidance, but it is a product of this world. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity, says Ecclesiastes. I find comfort in books, like Heschel. I find comfort in learning, music, creative things, but someone inevitably knocks on my door. And I am obliged to engage, but I'm also resistant to what will be asked of me. I yearn to help make things whole. I yearn for shalane. And at times I'm afraid to engage, and at times I am wary. Any choice I make, even the best of my choices, causes pain. We release the stone into the eternal pond and have no idea where and how the ripples travel. At times, I relate to the pious Rep. Mendel of Kutsk, whose standards of holiness were so strict that he could find no solace in community. It drove him off into the woods in isolation for the entire latter half of his life. Imagine that. Anachronistically, we would psychopathologize him. These days, we would look back at him and we would say, he must have been bipolar. <laughs> but I would ask, who at some point in their lives doesn't want to escape off into the woods? Yeah. <laughs> Only those whose lives are weaved so tight that they can no longer tell the forest from the trees. I understand why for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, Jewish men lost themselves in study. To find oneself in the world can be too much to bear. I wonder where Jewish women found their solace, banned from study for a thousand years. I wonder what worlds they got lost in to ease their pain. We cannot talk about moral engagement without first talking about disengagement, as Rabbi talked about. A necessary respite from the onslaught of creation and annihilation. Everybody disengages. It's part of our condition. We are mortal, finite, imperfect. We're human. Where do you go when you disengage? Heschel went to learning. Some go to work. Some go to art. Some go to action. Some go to sex. Some go to drugs. Some go to violence. Some of us, paradoxically, disengage in our relationships through what a therapist would call codependence, <laughs> defending against existential angst of being responsible for your life. Were Adam and Eve in a codependent relationship, meeting in some dark place, you and me against the world, baby! <laughs> So let's do some learning about it. We know we cannot talk about moral engagement without talking about moral disengagement. We've got that far. But what is moral disengagement? And what is moral engagement? And why is it so hard? Since Rosh Hashanah is the beginning, and in the beginning is where all the good secrets lie, let's start there. In Genesis 2.18, in the beginning of our Torah, or close to it, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him, an Ezer Konecto, a corresponding partner. Here we have great depth 
You know this story. God creates the world. God creates the animals. God creates Adam. But that's not enough. So God makes a woman from and for him. So I've read this many times, and I missed an obvious question every time. And it's a good question. Here's the question I would ask. Why is Adam considered alone? Put a different way. Why isn't a relationship with God enough? If he's got God, why is Adam alone? God was in the garden, chilling. Most of us would die for that kind of relationship. The most powerful being in the universe. It's like being a friend with a genie. <laughs> why is a relationship with God not enough? And here is the answer. It's not that it's not enough. It's too much. It's too horrifying. It's too awesome. In the Hebrew, the word is, all my rabbis, anybody, yira, awesomeness, fear and trembling. In Exodus, God tells Moses, you cannot see my face, for no man can see my face and live. We can't handle an intimate relationship with God directly. God keeps it too real for us. And as the sage Jack Nicholson once said, we can't handle the truth. <laughs> How do I know this? How do I know we can't have a relationship with God? It's in the next verses. Everybody knows this story, I'm assuming. I'll retell it if necessary. Okay. Adam and Eve eventually eat from the tree, forbidden fruit. They break the rules. God comes down to confront them, and they hide, lie. But God knows they're lying, because God is God, and God always knows what's going on. That's why God came down in the first place. So they lie, but you can't lie to God, which means you can't tell the truth to God, because you don't have the option to lie, because God already knows. And here is where we learn a deep Torah truth, and a deep truth about ourselves. One of the deepest truths. It's impossible to have a relationship with someone you can't lie to. You see? Make sense? What kind of relationship can you have with somebody if you can't lie to them? That's not a relationship. Because you could never get honest with such a person. You could never grow with such a person. You could never sit down and say those dreadful words, Honey, we need to talk. <laughs> Adam can't have a relationship with God. God is TMI. <laughs> Too much information. So what does God do? He puts Adam into a deep sleep. He takes a rib from him. And from it, he forms Eve a corresponding partner, or a helper, an Ezra Konegdo. Now Adam has somebody he can lie to. And someone who drags him into stuff that he doesn't want to be involved with. And Eve has somebody who will leave his underwear next to the hamper. Not appreciate her, but stay loyal to her, because it's the right thing to do. And now we have a relationship. Sounds familiar, right? Here we come to an understanding of moral engagement. And we can find out why it's so hard and yet so crucial if we look closely at Adam's relationship with Eve. Imagine when Adam took a bite of the fruit that Eve offers to him. Imagine it. Eve has just eaten a fruit that has both set her free and imprisoned her. Eve has just ingested the one thing God said not to. Imagine what she's thinking under the influence of this fruit. What does she do? She offers it to Adam, and he eats. It's a seminal event in the history of humanity. Imagine being Adam and looking at Eve's eyes in that moment. Really imagine it. She ate the apple. She passes it over. She gives it to you. You take a bite. You have a new consciousness, and then you both look at each other. Okay? What is the essence of that encounter? It is in this encounter that we can deconstruct moral engagement. Or more awesomely, we can encounter what it means to be a human, to live with, struggle with, and die with each other. 
It's all written in the look of their eyes that they share after they both eat the forbidden fruit. There are three things occurring in the look between Adam and Eve. Number one, Yira. When Adam looks at Eve in that moment, he sees too much. T-M-I. The same fear, horror, and awesomeness that we experience when we encounter God. He is looking into the eyes of another creator. Eve is made in God's image. We are all made in God's image. And when we see that, that much power, whew, to truly encounter another is to encounter the divine. That encounter is filled with Yira. It is standing strong in a moment of Yira with another human being that is one of the holy challenges of moral engagement. Number two, we encounter ourselves in the other party. As he glimpsed her divine, her divine and animalistic, selfish and selfless, paradoxical being, as Adam saw the image of God in her, Adam also saw himself, his divine soul, all he is and all he is capable of. When we encounter another person, we encounter ourselves, and that's not in the casual sense. It's in the way that rips the door off the hinges. One of the defining characteristics of moral engagement is when we wrestle with the soul of others, we discover ourselves, we discover who we are. Number three, we also encounter the other, someone else, not us. You could think of it like a stranger. We encounter someone like us, like God, but different, completely different. A being you will never know in their entirety. A being that is capable of hurting you, of loving you, of fixing you, of breaking you. A being as strange as God and as mysterious as you are. The spiritual path of enlightenment is a difficult one. It's the path of love and truth, two of the brightest lights that shine in our world. And at times it seems they are shining against each other, blinding us when in fact they're illuminating the many dimensions of our world, of our humanity, and the many faces of God. Harriet, Bela, and myself were talking about this concept, and Harriet asked the question, why is it so powerful, that intimate meeting in a dark place that Adam and Eve experienced? I can tell you my answers. For all our lofty principles of justice and fairness, love still has the most power even when it's wrong. This is one of the great challenges to moral engagement. It's not just loving one person, it's navigating, negotiating, and learning to live in community. It's eating the fruit and owning, oops, I made a mistake, and asking God, please wait, before you banish me, let's try to work this out. Let's stick it out. And continuing to be in relationship, even when it's difficult. Like Rabbi Heschel, I used to feel like an outcast. And then I realized we all do. To be human is to be orphaned. To be a Jew is to be orphaned, riddled with guilt. <laughs> In some ways, we are all orphans, banned from the garden. But we have each other. We have brothers. We have sisters. Billions of us. Hello, my brothers and sisters. Hello, my brothers and sisters. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Happy New Year, and welcome to the beginning. Welcome to the world of eternal beginnings. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. All of you. You are my brothers and sisters. You're also my parents, my parents. You're my children, my grandparents, my uncles, my cousins. We are all family. I love you all. Connect to your soul in this moment for a minute. I'll quiet down. You are the direct children of the Ribbono Shel Olam, and each of you deserves to be treated as the royalty you are. But we have to work real hard to remember our royal lineage. We are the descendants of great sages and Balchuvas. We are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. We are the children of King David and King Solomon, 
Every day, Adam and Eve, the matriarch and patriarch of our extended family, they pray in heaven that we will overcome ourselves, that we will love each other, serve God, and finish the job they started. Every time we fulfill a mitzvah, the Baal Shem Tov smiles and laughs in the next world. Every time a Jew shows up to Rosh Hashanah, on time or late, <laughs> Reb Nachman of Breslov dances in the fields of eternity. Can you see the miracle that we all are? It is a great honor and privilege to be here with all of you. We are orphaned, but we have each other. We should be good to each other. We are all we got. It is no accident that we need each other. The Rebono Shel Olam gave us the gift of freedom, and with that comes with the responsibility of taking care of each other and taking care of the world. Moral engagement. Can we elevate it, Ma? Can we sanctify it? Can we call it spiritual engagement? To take on the responsibility of tending my part of the garden, helping you with yours and asking for help with mine. God has given us the great gift of the largest family you could ever imagine. Every time I want to give up, I have another soul just like me, like you, yet infinitely unique, knock on my door and enter. That soul is an eternal world. To save one soul, it is as if, it, nah. <laughs> to save one soul, it is as if you save the entire world, our sages say. There is a whole world in each and every one of you. The scientists will tell you that you are the offspring of the stars. I will tell you, you are much more than stardust. You are a free child of the master of the universe herself. When you knock on my door, that knock was 15 billion years in the making. And you're playing your role in the divine script of redeeming the world. If you look up at me and I look up from my desk and we have eye contact and I smile and I invite you in, it is in the name of God. It is Rosh Hashanah, and we're celebrating beginnings. At Passover, we see ourselves through the eyes of our ancestors. At Rosh Hashanah and then Yom Kippur, we see ourselves anew. So let's see ourselves as the royalty, the princess and princesses that we are. Let's see each other as family. Spiritual engagement is messy, but if I can remember that you are my brother and you are my sister, and that when we struggle, we struggle in the name of God and for the sake of heaven, then I will know that I am never alone. I am loved by my God. I am loved by my people. And so are you. I would like to invite all of you to stand up for a quick moment, every one of you that's capable. We're doing this many times in the service, but like the shofar, it takes a lot to break through. Joel, I'll do it with you. Unless you have somebody already. Oh, no. You'll do it with us. We'll meet. Rabbi, would you be my partner for this? Would you mind? So here's all I want you to do. I just want you to put your hands on each other's shoulders. I just want you to smile and engage. For all of the times that we disengage, the sin of disengaging from each other and not treating each other like family, let's put our arms around each other. Let's tell each other we love each other. And let's wish each other a Shana Tovah.